So welcome, everyone. Um, so as Teresa said, I have the honor of moderating this panel discussion on Jack Balkans and Sandy Levinson's new book, Democracy and Dysfunction. Um, it's a fascinating, uh, all too timely exploration of the structural problems plaguing our democracy from specific features uh, of our system, like the Electoral College, the Senate, to more diffuse problems of unrepresentative government, like the vast sums of money in politics, disenfranchisement, extreme political polarization, and executive overreach. Um, so we are in for a fascinating conversation. I will introduce our commentators. Um, Jack and Sandy will speak for, uh, they'll start us off with some remarks. Each of the commentators will give some brief remarks. I'll facilitate some back and forth, um, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, so immediately to my left, we have Justin Driver, professor of law at Yale Law School. Professor Driver teaches and writes in the area of constitutional law. He joined the faculty here at Yale Law this summer. He was previously the Harry Wyatt Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. Uh, his most recent book, which I believe he presented last week at this same series, um, is entitled The Schoolhouse Gate, Public Education, and the Supreme Court in the Battle for the American Mind. He regularly publishes in law reviews, as well as for more general audiences and publications like The Atlantic, Slate, The New York Times, etc. Um, next, uh, Jacob Hacker, the Stanley uh, Rezer Professor of Political Science and Director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University. He's a regular media commentator and policy advisor, as well as the author or co-author of five books, numerous journal articles, a wide range of popular writings on American politics and public policy. Uh, his work is highly relevant to the topics that are discussed in Democracy and Dysfunction, uh, including um, his New York Times bestseller book, Winner Take All Politics, How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned Its Back on the Middle Class. And finally, Robert Post, Sterling Professor of Law at Yale Law School. He served as dean here from 2009 till 2017. Professor Post specializes in constitutional law, particular emphasis on the First Amendment. He is also a legal historian. Uh, he has also written uh, many acclaimed articles on uh, topics relevant to our talk, to name just two, his book, Citizens Divided, A Constitutional Theory of Campaign Finance Reform, his forward in the Harvard Law Review, Fashioning, Fashioning the Legal Constitution, Culture, Courts, and the Law. Um, so I will turn it over to Jack and Sandy so to start Sandy, us off. Start for I'm under instructions to talk for seven minutes, so I'd like to come in at that. Uh, I'd add one other slight detail to the Altogenous introduction. Um, Jack and I have written, I think, 20 articles together, and I don't know if that's a current record in the Academy for jointly produced articles that we look at, me. but the relationship with Jack has certainly been the most important professional and personal relationship really in my life. Um, so in 2015, when we were invited to participate in a conference at University of Indiana in Indianapolis on the state of American politics or something like that, one temptation was just to do another joint article, um, but we didn't. And the reason for doing that is because, although obviously we write with one voice when we collaborate, there are differences between us. And with regard to diagnosing our situation in 2015, both of us thought that it might be interesting to explore those differences and the epistolary form was a way of doing that. Um, Briefly, very briefly, from my point of view, Jack doesn't so much overemphasize the importance of political culture as focuses on it almost to the exclusion of what I have become a near fanatic about, which is the importance of formal institutions. One of the real paradoxes, both within the American Legal Academy and my other identity as a political scientist, 
is the uncertain status that formal institutions really share. How important is the Constitution anyway? I think among many political scientists, I'll be very, very interested um, um, in what Jacob has to say about this. The answer, going back to my time as a graduate student now, literally 55 years ago, is not very much. The most important single book when I was a graduate student was The Civic Culture, uh, which is all about how liberal democracy is explicable through looking at political culture, economic development, stuff like that. But formal institutions really don't matter for one way or the other. Um, in law school, obviously, we teach, and Yale is the opinion of this, we teach about the Constitution almost obsessively. But from my perspective, we teach only one part of the Constitution. That is what I have grown to call um, and unfortunately, other people haven't adopted this terminology, but what I call the constitution of conversation. That is, what, what is litigated? What can we argue about? What is subject to multiple theories of interpretation? All of this is very interesting. Um, and, you know, I two happiest teaching experiences of my life were when I was teaching the um, introductory course at the Yale Law School in 2006 and 2011. Um, and we spent a lot of time on how to interpret the Constitution conversation. Um, but I have now become more interested in or obsessed by, by what I call the Constitution of Settlement. The stuff we never talk about in law school because there's nothing to litigate about. We talk endlessly about the counter majoritarian difficulty of judicial review, which I think is greatly overestimated, and never talk about the counter majoritarian difficulty of the presidential veto, or the US Senate, which is a terrible, terrible institution, indefensible under any 21st theory century of democracy. Um, and so that's what I'm more interested in. And so the first exchange was Jack, it's not that I disagree with you about the importance of <clears throat> social media, campaign finance, and stuff like that, but I think you ought to pay more attention to the hardwired structures. Anyway, that was 2015. We did a second round because the, law, the issue wasn't published, I think, until February or so. But then what was really important is how wrong both of us were in our short-term predictions about American politics. We had a diagnosis about what the problems were in 2015, but we both treated Donald Trump as a clown, which he is, but we also assumed that the inference from that almost self-evident truth is that there was no chance he could become the nominee of the Republican Party, um, and we had good political science, the explanations for why that wouldn't happen. Um, but then, lo and behold, we all know what happened. He did get the nomination. And so we continued the letters, even after the University of Indiana Law Review came out, partly because they could always be published in balkanization, but also in the back of our minds was that it might be of some interest to watch two people who thought that they were quite knowledgeable and sophisticated about American politics feel their way through a situation where we were just getting it wrong in a number of important ways. But still, our priors matter, because I continue to believe. We wrote these letters back and forth. We stopped abruptly at New Year's 2018. And the University of Chicago Press was kind enough to publish those collected letters. Uh, it certainly might be interesting if we picked it up again. There's more to write about, God knows. But you know, our priors still operate that although I think both of us concede there are genuine merits in the other's argument, it remains true more than ever that I really dislike the United States Constitution. I think it is strangling us. It is a clear and present danger in a number of ways that I would gladly explicate 
at greater length, along with all the problems that Jack identifies. I think Jack is willing to concede that there are some problems with the formal structure, but he's not the hysteric that I am with regard to spreading the news. So I do view myself as either Paul Revere or Cassandra. Um, and I'm afraid that it's Cassandra. That is, I do believe in the validity of my predictions. I know for a fact that almost nobody agrees with me. I can't even care in my own household, say, with regard to the desirability of new constitutional convention, which I'm almost unique in continuing to want. Uh, my wife and I wrote a book directed toward teenagers uh, called Fault Lines in the Constitution that focuses on the structural parts, not on the rights stuff. Um, we took, we, like as with Jack, we speak in one voice until the penultimate chapter, at which time Cynthia and I have debate about the wisdom of new constitutional convention. And like almost all of my friends, family, and professional colleagues, she thinks the idea is just bonkers. And I persist. So, yeah, let me stop there. <laughs> Great. Um, so, I, I, I'm so glad you could all come out uh, this evening. I'm really delighted to see you. Uh, Sandy and I, this, for, Sandy and I, this was a, book was a labor of love. We really enjoyed it. We had an enormous time doing it, even though, of course, the events didn't turn out as we hoped. Uh, but uh, Sandy has basically teed up for you what the basic just the debate in the book is about. Sandy's view is that most of our problems, our current dysfunction of the Constitution, come from what he calls the hardwired Constitution. That's the part of the Constitution that you really can't change without a new amendment or a new constitutional convention. And that's not my view. Uh, my view is that most of our problems uh, come from what I'll call the constitutional order, which is all the, the, the basic structures of government plus all of the practices, institutions, uh, doctrines and rules that basically produce the democracy we have. And my view is that a lot of the problems we have uh, can be achieved without new amendments, but through various uh, reforms, constitutional workarounds, changes in the judiciary, new doctrines, new practices. So in other words, it's I'm not against new amendments. I think new amendments are just fine. I'm not even against a new constitutional convention. I just don't think that's the easiest way to produce reform. And indeed, um, you will find that it's much easier to pass statutes than to amend the Constitution, and it's going to be probably easier to change the composition of the Supreme Court than it is to amend the Constitution or, or to have a new constitutional convention. So that's basically one of our big differences. But a different uh, dispute in the book relies on the notion of how to diagnose what's going on. And let me give you my account of what I think has been going on and where we're likely to go in the future. That's what I want to spend on most of my time talking about. In my view, uh, why our current problems are existing is, well, three basic ideas. First, we are in a period of transition between the previous political regime, which is the regime that's basically put in place by Ronald Reagan's election in 1980, and which is the regime in which neoliberalism is the basic set of political agendas, uh, in which politi uh, political um, the dominant party is the Republican Party, and the forms of possible politics, that is, the politics that people can imagine, are decidedly to the right. And so this is the period of the conservative revolution, of, of lower tax, uh, great tax cuts, low uh, redistribution upward to the wealthy, weakened labor unions, and a whole series of other things you're all familiar with. It's the politics you grew up in. That regime is slowly grinding to a halt. Uh, for many, many reasons, which I talk about in the book. And we are not yet, however, at a period when a new political regime, one which I expect will probably be, have the Democrats as the, Democrat, uh, as the dominant party, uh, that isn't quite here yet. We're in a kind of holding pattern. And during these periods of transition between one regime and a new regime, it's usually a very confusing time. Uh, I lived through the last one, which was the period between uh, the, in the late 70s and early 80s. It was the transition from the New Deal civil rights regime to the Reagan regime, which I like to call the last days of disco. And, and during this period, many people thought that, that, was, that government was too difficult and one person couldn't be president. And there were many, many confusions and, and disappointments about the nature of American democracy. But you know, within six years, people stopped saying that. Uh, so the first thing is that we're in transition to a new regime. The second thing 
um, is that that regime was actually pretty, uh, transition was pretty easy. This one is very hard. And the reason it's very hard is that unlike the period of the late 70s, early 80s, we're in a period of extremely high polarization. By polarization, I don't mean partisanship. Partisanship is you don't like the guys in the other party. Polarization means, and conflict extension means, that if I know your position on X, I also know your position on Y and Z and A and B and C. And the parties have completely lined up opposite on almost every issue, <coughs> whether or not the issues are related to each other in any way. And so it is, it is a zero-sum contest. It's a death match. And it is producing all sorts of problems in our politics. Um, this polarization makes the transition to a new regime very difficult. Because you see, if you are in the dominant party and you're losing your dominance, and the other party is going to take over, well, you're going to lose everything. Because you don't agree with the other party on anything. That wasn't true in the 70s. And that means that if you lose, you lose big. And therefore, you will do everything in your power to prevent yourself from losing political control. You will take out every trick in the book. You will try anything. Desperate times lead to desperate measures. It is basically a desperate, desperate period. And so we see this in American politics. We see the Republican Party, the dominant party, losing its control and now trying everything it can to entrench itself into power. And that leads to the third uh, cause of our current situation. When you have periods like this, you also have a period of what I call constitutional rot. What I mean by constitutional rot is very simple. It's the decline in the institutions and features of a democracy that preserve it as democratic, that is responsive to, uh, to popular opinion, and republican, that is, in which people are devoted to the public good as opposed to a particular private interest. Republics, the frame, framers understood, are very delicate uh, institutions, easily corrupted, and that uh, it's very difficult to keep people focused on the public interest and the public good. And what has happened over the course of approximately 40 years, this is something that Jacob has written about, is that there's been a, uh, a series of very, very bad economic and fiscal decisions which have redistributed risk downward to ordinary Americans and redistributed wealth upward to the richest Americans. So that when the economy has grown, Almost all of the benefits of the growth in the economy have gone to a relatively small number of people at the top of the income distribution, and most everybody else hasn't basically gotten very much out of it. And so when economic crises <coughs> come, as they did during 2008, basically it has made uh, democracy very, very difficult, not only in the, around the world, but in the United States. These are times in which people begin to distrust each other, in which politics cruelly becomes a war of all against all, in which people regard their political opponents not merely as opponents, but as enemies to be destroyed. And it's a period in which demagogues tend to arise. It's a period in which politics becomes almost impossible. And this makes the transition to a new regime even more difficult. So we are suffering currently from a transition to a new regime, a period of extremely high polarization, and advanced constitutional rot. That doesn't sound very good. Can we get out of it? Well, there are two historical analogies in American history. One you're not going to like. That's the Civil War, a period of high polarization and advanced constitutional rot. Let's hope it doesn't turn out that way. The other period in American history featuring high polarization and advanced constitutional rot is a little better. That is the period of the late 19th century, early 20th century. It's the Gilded Age as it moves into the Progressive Era. I will describe the Gilded Age for you. It was a period of enormous technological innovation that produced huge fortunes, per a period of huge waves of immigration, which changed people's notions of what it meant to be America. To be America. It was a period, stop me if any of this is familiar. It was a period of heightened racial antagonism. It was a period of deep political corruption in which people feared that government was essentially for sale. That was the Gilded Age. Guess what, folks? We're in the second Gilded Age right now. And what happened at the end of the Gilded Age? Well, it basically slowly transitions to the Progressive Era, a period in which people get sick and tired of the rot and corruption in American politics and begin reforms, not just at the federal level, but also at the state and local levels. And I think that's the best story of what is likely to happen. We are transitioning slowly and difficultly into a second Progressive Era. That is the best. But I should just tell you, Progressive Era was not sunshine and roses. 
It was not lollipops and unicorns. It was a very difficult time. There was enormous amounts of political strife and difficulty. If th that is, however, I think what our future is. Our future is a period of reform, including, by the way, constitutional reform. That was also a feature of the progressive era. And it's going to be a very difficult situation for some time. But we got through it before. I believe we'll get through it again. Yeah, so let me begin by thanking Sandy and Jack for producing this wonderful book that offers these real-time reactions to a significant moment in American politics. And I choose the word significant as a weasel word because they view things rather differently. For Sandy, ours is a cataclysmic, perhaps even apocalyptic moment. For Jack, I think it would be more accurate to say it's a turbulent moment. Um, and I choose that thinking about the airplanes, about you know turbulence, where you have a moment of uncertainty, but there's not a great expectation that the airplane is going down. Uh, you use the term holding pattern, and it's a similar uh, sort of you know, uh, airplane metaphor. And so it's with this in mind, uh, the book inspired a great many thoughts for me, but I want to focus on what I think of as a major theme that runs throughout the book, although they don't use this terminology, about constitutional optimism and constitutional pessimism. Uh, when I read the book, I could hear their voices. And um, for me, I think that it's safe to say that Sandy is more often than not a constitutional pessimist on this front, uh, and that Jack is a constitutional optimist. I sort of would envision them holding signs that you might see by the end of the road. And for Sandy, I imagine him holding a sign that says, the end is near, right? <laughs> and for Jack, our constitutional pe uh, optimist, I should say, he is holding a sign that says, there are brighter days ahead, right? Uh, things, things aren't as bad as you think. One thing that the, this constitutional optimism and constitutional pessimism made me think of was, uh, that these are modern examples of a long-standing phenomenon. And I think back to Frederick Douglass, who was both a constitutional optimist and a constitutional pessimist. I bring up Douglass in part because in an earlier collaboration, uh, thanks to your textbook, the Brest, Levinson, Balkan, Amar, and Siegel casebook, I read from as a student at Harvard Law School. And I encountered an underappreciated constitutional theorist named Frederick Douglass. And uh, he spoke about uh, the Constitution as fundamentally being anti-slavery. He does so in part by thinking about the distinction between the original uh, you know, intent and the original public meaning uh, in modern terminology. Uh, and, but he was not always an optimist. He was also a pessimist before this, where in uh, 1850, he wrote in the North Star, and he talked about sort of condemning the Constitution for supporting and perpetuating this monstrous system of injustice and blood. And so uh, Sandy, I'll speak a little bit more about his pessimism and where it comes from. Obviously, as he suggests, he's focused on the Constitution of Conversation and the Constitution of Settlement. Far too much attention is paid uh, to the former and insufficient to the latter. Almost none, I think Sandy would say. Um, and this becomes because we have insufficient attention to the two-senator rule uh, that comes out of the Constitution, the Electoral College as well. There are all these hardwired parts of the Constitution uh, that deform our uh, democracy. Uh, Sandy has uh, you know, a very sort of jaundiced view. I, I jotted down some of the uh, apocalyptic statements. I'll share some of them with you. Um, he says, I worry about getting to 2020. We are in the most serious existential internal crisis since 1860. Uh, he talks about the truly terrible possibility of a catastrophic war even holds out the possibility that mushroom clouds are in our future. Uh, and there's also a notion that uh, the country could well fracture, right? That we will no longer have a United States, that there's going, we are now in what he thinks of as we'll call Atlantica, and there will be a Pacifica as well. And uh, for some of us, this is a, a term of dread, but Dixie he holds out as well. Um, and so this is, the, this is the pessimism that's there. For, for Jack, it's a very different story, exactly as he said a moment ago, uh, that we are in a period of realignment. We've seen these before. 
Uh, and there are, importantly, workarounds to the hardwired features of our Constitution. Uh, it doesn't necessarily take a constitutional amendment, perhaps, to get around some of the concerns uh, that Sandy uh, has identified. Uh, there will be, Jack insists, a new regime that will uh, sort of supplant the Reagan regime, and he suggests that there is reason to believe that it will uh, grow out of the Democratic Party. Here are the sort of you know, key words, and these come from the, their last missive. Uh, he says, we should see the glint of opportunity in our current darkness. He says, out of the disaster comes hope. Right? These are the key ideas. This is a difficult moment. There's no doubt about it. But again, there are brighter days ahead. I should say as well that when I was reading the book, uh, that there was a sense that uh, their uh, constitutional optimism and constitutional pessimism don't map so readily onto the personalities of the people that I know. Uh, there's a real sort of disjuncture there. Uh, Sandy is uh, ebullient, relentlessly enthusiastic, I would say. And I know this lesson very well. I have had the great good fortune of beginning my career at the University of Texas alongside Sandy. And we would go out to lunch with great regularity. And I would pitch him these very ill-thought out ideas and say, do you think that could be a large article? I mean, these things were not an eighth baked, right? I mean, they aspired to half baked them. And Sandy almost invariably would say, uh, that's really interesting, you know, and then <laughs> proceed to refine this idea and make it much, much better than it ever was. And I'm incredibly grateful to him for doing that. And so he was an optimist, right? And there are so many people in legal academia who say, no, 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 there's no paper here whatsoever. It will not work. And Sandy's the optimist. So he's an optimist, no person. I don't think that the sort of inversion between the professorial and the personal is quite so uh, sharp with Jack, uh, but I do think it is there. He's certainly an upbeat person, but he's not known, at least in my experience, to hold forth about sunshine and rainbows and unicorns and things like that. He is no stranger uh, to the acerbic comment, I dare say. Um, and this realization helped me to appreciate that uh, the constitutional optimism and constitutional pessimism are uh, perhaps, and I'm tipping my hat to Jack's previous work on living originalism, you know, the opposite side of the same coin. That is to say that there are notes of constitutional optimism in Vulcan's world and constitutional pessimism in Levinson's world. With respect to Sandy, you heard him talk about this idea that uh, there should be a new constitutional convention. That is an incredibly optimistic uh, sort of stance to take. Many of us would say that there are serious problems in our current constitutional moment, but do we really want to throw everything up for grabs? And indeed, some people would surely say that uh, to do so would lead to a greater sort of fracturing along the lines that uh, you uh, perhaps prophesy with respect to Atlantica and Dixie and Pacifica. You know, for, for Jack, um, there are moments of constitutional pessimism. As he suggested a moment ago, the term constitutional rot isn't especially uh, sort of uh, an enticing one. And perhaps more broadly, Jack is very much focused on the cycles of political alignment and realignment. And it's at least possible that one might think that uh, our current period of dysfunction is going to revisit us. That's to say that this is something like inevitable. When you hear the term cycles, it makes us think that this is not a momentary thing. This is to say that bad days may well be on the horizon. Um, and so for those of us who have spent the last three years or so finding this incredibly unsettling, I don't relish another moment of realignment in the next uh, three decades. So, uh, you know, I'm going to now think a little bit about being optimistic and pessimistic toward their book, okay? Um, the optimism is, it's, it's a wonderful exchange. The epistolary uh, move is really valuable and severely underutilized to allow them to, to allow us to peek behind and see what they're saying to one another 
in ways, especially for uh, scholars, including modeling scholarly disagreement. This is really valuable, as they suggested. Too often we speak with one voice, but here um, there is an exchange in important uh, disagreements, and I think it's valuable for that reason. If I were to be a pessimist, uh, you know, and others have voiced this concern, uh, I think of Eric Posner, who says, uh, on balkanization, uh, you know, well, do they really disagree about that much, right? They are starting more or less from the same uh, position, and you could say, where is either Sandy or Jack in conversation with, say, Sai Prakash of the University of Virginia or Adrian Vermeule from right up the road here? Or you could think about a younger generation of people like uh, my old colleague Will Bode at the University of Chicago or Tara Lee Grove uh, of William and Mary. This point might be extended to say that the debate, such as it is here, uh, sort of intensifies the phenomenon that it ports to diagnose. That is to say that they're interested in part in the breakdown and the fracturing of American society. And we know from some social scientists that suggest that uh, when we deliberate with like-minded folks, people become more extreme uh, in their understandings. Um, and so uh, I should also say that this panel is the nay plus ultra of this phenomenon, right? <laughs> we have a wide array of viewpoints, everyone from liberal constitutional law professors to liberal political scientists are represented on this panel here. Uh, and if we're truly concerned about the way in which we operate in bubbles, uh, we need to be uh, careful to reach out and try to have you know, genuine exchanges and, uh, and, and conversations. Okay, uh, should we, and this I'll wrap up here, should we be constitutional optimists or constitutional pessimists? Some optimists, I would have thought, would think that the pessimists are making matters worse by suggesting that our current constitutional order is more fixed than it actually is. Uh, Jack did say, I'm not opposed to constitutional amendments, but you might imagine some people say, that's not the right way to go, because when you say we need a constitutional amendment, it's an acceptance of the current regime as needing an Article V amendment or even a uh, constitutional convention. Some pessimists, constitutional pessimists, could say, you know, you constitutional optimists are incredibly blind, right? You're not going to be able to talk your way out of this one with respect to these foundational concerns. Uh, the constitutional, con constitutional conversation is not going to get it done. Um, it's possible, though, that asking whether we should be constitutional optimists or constitutional pessimists is, is the wrong question. Uh, and it makes me think about the civil rights movement and saying, should we be Malcolm X or should we be Martin Luther King? Uh, and maybe the right way to go is that multiple approaches uh, lead to the best result of all. And that the combination of the two strategies will leave our constitutional order in the strongest shape possible. And so I want to be leave off where I began by thanking Jack and Sandy for writing this book. Uh, any volume that produces so many thoughts uh, is, at least for me, cause for optimism. So thanks. Thank you. What time are we wrapping up at, just so I know? Uh, we'll, the full thing at 7.45. We'll 745. try to transition Great. the questions around 7.15-ish. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm the representative political scientist. And I will say that um, were there an exchange of this sort between two political scientists, and it wasn't me and my co-author, Paul Pearson, who were doing the exchange, um, it would probably take the form of a endless debate about <laughs> voters and elections, and um, maybe a little bit on institutions with those understood to be basically uh, congressional rules. And so it's very. It's very uh, clarifying and welcome to have this broader discussion, which is so which is so important at this particular moment. Now, my 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 sense is that yes, I agree with Justin that there's a lot of agreement here and values, but it, there is there is real disagreement and um, both assessments of the nature of the political crisis we face um, today. And, um, and very much so in, with regard to strategic judgments about what uh, those who are concerned about it should think would be a, um, a, a um, valuable course forward in responding. And 
And, and I would just say, because I want to focus a lot on the arguments, that, um, that it's really a, an exchange worth reading. Um, my, view is, my view is kind of summed up in one statement by Sandy at the end of his letter, I think his last one. He says, it's been a sheer pleasure engaging in this exchange, save for the fact that it has forced us to confront what are distinctly unpleasant aspects about the country we live in and love. And, and I, that was my own feeling. Um, and since I'm uh, thinking about those unpleasant aspects all the time anyway, um, I, I didn't find that too off-putting. So I've, I'm generally a kind of split the difference kind of guy. Um, uh, and so it's probably not a surprise that to me at least, that I find myself somewhere between Jack and Sandy. Um, on the one hand, I think Jack's uh, diagnosis of what's wrong, in which he nicely uh, summed up uh, the intersection of these three trends, uh, is really quite um, uh, 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 <coughs> astute and, and uh, largely correct. Um, and I'm skeptical of the scope uh, for major changes in our Constitution, uh, much as I agree with Sandy um, that they're needed. And indeed, that's, that's the other. The, on the other hand, I think um, far more of our, our present political crisis has to do with an aging constitutional order than I think Jack does, um, which may leave me as a uh, somewhat more uh, pessimistic than even Sandy, uh, but we'll see in a moment. Uh, indeed, I, I feel as if, um, for all of the alarm, um, I'm not sure they're alarmed enough. Um, and the reason that I feel that way is that um, I, think, I think Jack's absolutely right. This is a very perilous moment. And it's a perilous moment um, because, precisely because the current um, GOP regime is endangered. A danger, endangered regime is a dangerous one. Um, so the, sometimes the way I like to think about it, or not like to think about it, is that there's kind of, we see a light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not quite sure if that light is the sunny valley beyond or a train hurtling towards us. Um, and, um, and, and, and let me, let me make that a little bit more precise. Um, uh, Jack, drawing on my colleague Steve Skoranek, emphasizes the, na the, de the decaying nature of the Republican regime. And, um, and, and that decay takes many forms, but one of the most obvious is that it's, a, it's right, a regime that has a very difficult time winning popular majorities, right? After all, the two most recent Republican presidents came into office without popular vote majorities. Um, Republicans routinely lose um, the Senate uh, popular vote, if you were thinking of adding up all the votes uh, for senators, um, but maintain, Republicans maintain strong Senate margins. Um, they've got about a six-point advantage in uh, the House vote um, relative to their national popular margins. Not enough to protect them in 2018, but still a pretty nice little cushion if you can get it. Um, and so as a majoritarian strategy, it does seem as if uh, white ethno-nationalist populism isn't going to work out too well. Um, that's kind of a question of math. Um, but what will follow is obviously a question of politics. Um, if something has to give, it will. Uh, but whether that something is ethno-nationalist populism or the American experiment with majoritarian rule is the big and um, difficult question. And I think part of the reason why it's fraught is that it's not just a demographic story. It's not just a story about uh, a majority uh, uh, sorry, a Republican regime that is supported by a dwindling um, uh, demographic. Um, and it's also a story, as, as Jack um, pointed out, of the way in which what he calls oligarchy, what I would call plutocracy, uh, has distorted uh, our politics. Um, and if you look historically, and Daniel Ziblatt has done a wonderful job of discussing this in the context of um, conservative parties in Europe, when you see massive extreme inequality um, in a democracy, you see uh, a number of very unsavory consequences. Uh, you see a shift of power to economic elites. You see a shift in the preferences of those elites that bring them more into conflict with the interests of their fellow citizens. And you see a decline in support for democracy among those elites. Um, now, this is, I think, often kind of pilloried as the view that the sort of the, 
the rich are all hardcore conservative Republicans, and uh, they all um, support the Republican Party uh, and conservative economic policies, which clearly isn't true. Uh, but if you look closely at the most organized segments of the American plutocracy, um, there is a very strong uh, conservative uh, bias. And I think it's pretty clear that the Republican <coughs> Party, as Jack has argued, is, uh, has aligned itself fully with those conservative economic priorities. Um, what I think is less well recognized and what Ziblatt brings out is when conservative parties, which are the parties that are most traditionally associated with patrons, uh, uh, economic pa uh, elites as their patrons, when they're confronted with this dilemma of a changing electorate um, and, uh, and need to think about whether to moderate their economic stances, they are very tempted to turn to divisive appeals, right? The kinds of appeals um, that uh, we see today um, in, uh, racial, in, the, in the explicit uh, uh, invocation of themes of racial and, and cultural backlash. So um, the book that Paul Pearson and I are just finishing up is entitled Let Them Eat Tweets, um, and, which kind of sums up what I think happens in this uh, context. And, and it makes us realize that in a lot of ways that it's right-wing plutocrats, not right-wing populists, that were the first uh, force to radicalize American politics in the last generation. Uh, the other thing, and this is where I'm really with Sandy, is that plutocracy is so problematic because of the nature of American political institutions. The vulnerabilities in our political institutions are, I think, two in particular loom large. First, our system is, is emphasis on representing geographic areas has uh, meant uh, a growing rural bias. Um, and second, the separation of powers has intersected with that, uh, both plutocracy and that bias in ways that are quite troubling. Um, so the, the rural part is easy, right? In, in over-representing rural areas, our political electoral institutions uh, over uh, advantage the GOP. And of course, the GOP has exploited the many weaknesses of those electoral institutions to further advantage itself through voter suppression, gerrymandering, and all the other tricks of the trade we know about. But I think what's less well recognized is how that also interacts with constitution separations of power. Because the, came, the same kind of radicalization that we're seeing uh, in uh, the, the Republican uh, Party's uh, appeals to these uh, non-urban areas uh, are actually pushed along by a lot of the difficulties that our Constitution creates for the wielding of public authority. Um, in a way, we are stuck in a vicious cycle in which um, it's very hard to govern, and people uh, get very angry at a government that's unable to govern. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Steve Bannon uh, put it best when he said they always had a backup strategy with Hillary Rodham Clinton. Our backup strategy said is to fuck her up so badly that she can't govern. And that's, of course, what would have happened and they expect, and Jack and Sandy expected to happen. Um, it's also true that uh, Trump benefited quite a bit from the fact that our presidential system allowed a kind of half of the half strategy where he uh, took over uh, a, an entire party with his appeals um, through uh, uh, by, with about half of the Republican base, uh, and then, of course, managed through a combination of, uh, of good luck um, and, um, and uh, bad strategy on the other side, um, and, as well as our political institutions to get the Supreme Court. And I won't even go into the threat of creep, uh, that is posed by our current Supreme Court, um, which, of course, has been overwhelmingly stacked by a party that, again, has um, barely been able to win popular vote majorities. Um, so I think, um, I think a lot of the fear right now is on this sort of threat of creeping authoritarianism. Um, and that's well re reflected in, say, the Levitsky uh, and Ziblatt book, um, uh, how democracies die. Um, but the bigger threat in many ways is the creeping counter-majoritarianism that is uh, embodied in these developments. And indeed, the, the Supreme Court has always been a bastion of counter-majoritarianism, but it's never been a, that we've never seen a Supreme Court that is um, so closely aligned with a party that is also committed to counter-majoritarianism. 
counter-majoritarianism through the malapportioned Senate, the use of the filibuster, uh, and the exploitation of the rural bias in our political institutions. Now, the, the last thing I want to um, uh, 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 talk about is what this implies about where we go from here. And, um, and as I think Jack and Sandy really well articulate, the problem isn't so much polarization, right? It's the asymmetric polarization of parties where the Republican Party is really radicalized and the Democratic Party looks a lot like a conventional center-left party in other rich democracies. Um, and, uh, and that's part of the reason why I, I don't know how productive those conversations are going to be across, um, across uh, at least academics thinking about this, because we really don't have uh, two parties that are operating in the same way. And as a result, Trump is in many ways uh, a product, uh, not just a producer of this polarization. And, and therefore, his losing office is, is, is surely not enough to dislodge these dynamics. And so what, what would? Um, so to me, the, 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 very, the imperative is pretty basic. And I don't think it's nearly as automatic as, as some of what Jack says about the sort of Skoranian cycles of political time might suggest. It's basically, how do you recreate a modern Republican Party? Um, and, um, and, and I can see some hope. I see it in Charlie Baker of Massachusetts, or Larry Hogan of Maryland, or Chris Sununo of New Hampshire, or Phil Scott of Vermont, right? Uh, blue, uh, four of the five most popular governors in the United States today, uh, Republicans in blue states, right? I don't see that. Uh, you might see it in also states that have tipped over um, to the other side, though California is a pretty cautionary tale because the Republican Party is now less popular than none of the above, i.e. independence. And if you want to have a healthy, robust democracy, you actually have to have an effect, effective political competition, and that means you need to have moderate. Uh, you have to have moderate Republicans uh, back. Um, so, how do we get to the end of that tunnel bef uh, without the train coming in? And um, I will just end because I have ideas about that, and uh, but I don't want to take up more time talking about them. I'll just end by saying that to me, that's. The, the fundamental question and where our political reforms are going to have to be focused. And ultimately, I think it really rests on a simple realization, which is the levels of inequality we have today are not compatible with a well-functioning democracy. If we don't address that and the imbalances of organized power that are a result of it, we're not going to address the underlying uh, problem. And it's obviously not going to happen overnight or quickly, <laughs> but if we could replace the vicious cycle right now of imbalance uh, opposition, gridlock, um, resentment, reaction, and, uh, and counter-majoritarianism with a virtuous cycle of political and economic reform, uh, we might well be able to escape uh, from that tunnel uh, intact. So thanks. Uh, so I'll be very quick because everything worth saying is been said. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jack and Sandy this book. I want to say it's a pleasure to come across an epistolary novel after these many centuries. <laughs> You're a devoted friend <laughs> at the end of the table. Uh, it, you know, it, it, uh, it evokes a kind of decorum and civility that's precisely missing in the political system, so the form and the content kind of, um, kind of matched. Uh, but uh, of, of course, this book begins with a very a well-formed disagreement, uh, which Jack put on the table between the hardwired constitution and what Jack just called the constitutional order. And we're debating about, you know, what's the true cause of American dysfunction. And uh, because it's in real time, it gets taken over by Trump. And this well-formed disagreement kind of fades to the background and kind of grades into a rising sense of panic. and. Um, dismay at what's happening in, in the world. And so uh, it's, it's a book that's a little hard to get your hands around in terms of an organized argument. And what um, comes through the pages of this book much more clearly than a defined set of disagreements is the wondrous sensibility of these two, as they put in the back of the book, these two <coughs> superstars who are 
fabulous people and who show themselves in the nature of these letters much more than they show a coherent line of argument in which are, um, which are uh, disagreeing with each other. And to me, the basic argument is, well, my sense is, yeah, it could be a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, a little hardwired here, a little culture here. You needn't pick one or the other. We could have a combination. So I've never quite understood why that should be a basic of anything, a basis of anything fundamental um, by way of a disagreement. Much more interesting to me is um, the way in which these arguments are deployed in the context of two supremely intelligent people looking at what's happened to this country in the last three years. So I want to start with Sandy. I can remember when you were teaching here in 2011 and you were teaching constitutional law, and your memory, I think, has been misted a little bit in the in retrospect, because you were kvetching endlessly. I'm teaching them structure, and they don't care about structure. You know what I'm and the students are, they want rights, they don't want structure. Um, what's, what's really interesting about Sandy's um, argument about, about uh, the hardwired difficulty in American Constitution is, in many, not in all, but in many of its aspects, it comes down to the fact that our institutions distort a true picture of the popular will. They check the popular will. They don't allow us to um, express it in, in any true way. And um, that's true, of course. You know, the framers, uh, Madison posted in the Federalist Papers, we've designed a form of government which absolutely excludes the people in every respect from any participation in, the, in, the, in, in, in this government. Um, so of course, it was meant to do exactly what Sandy is complaining. So underlying that, you would think Sandy would be a fan of the public will. But actually, what comes out of this book, as Justin was observing, is this dread of the popular will. I mean, the minute Sandy gets close to the actual popular will, um, uh, out comes the kind of passages that Justin was describing. Out comes a fear of secession, of civil war. It's like, who wants this popular will? I mean, if it's really this popular will, it's going to be an overwhelming disaster. So I read, I can't help but read, Sandy's focus on uh, these structural uh, deformities as a displacement. Like, I have to reform the structure, but if you took five steps down the road, could, what would that actually get you if we were in a real parliamentary demo? You would get something actually much more disagreeable. And so rather focus on the structure than the underlying pessimistic take of the people whose will we actually want to make the government transparent to. Um, and conversely, Jack, um, uh, and Jack in this book, uh, every letter is a different form of comfort. You know, every letter is a different form of, uh, well, these, these cycles and there's this form of political time and then there's this epicycle and it's all gonna save you because Hegel teaches us that history is cunning and it may seem turbulent right now, it was Justin's word, but really around the corner we're gonna come out of this some other way. So Jack has this, uh, Jack is acutely aware of, of all the difficulties, but Jack is an urgent optimist, and I cannot help but read Jack's um, endless appeals to the political science of culture as a displacement from the real despair, which he shares with Sandy, and comes out and, 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 uh, and which he conquers through this kind of avuncular optimism and comfort, and I cannot resist, you know, watching the 2016 election with him where he's confidently predicting Hillary's going to win like watching it happen in real time. Um, so uh, I'm, I think what um, uh, 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 Sandy and Jack share is uh, an acute sense of the, um, the dysfunctions uh, to which we're um, subject, but they have two different strategies of ameliorating um, that uh, extreme discomfort. One strategy is to give us patterns of history which will repeat and which will save us from ourselves. Of course, I don't believe that for a minute. I think history is contingent. I'm with Jacob that, you know, it, the, the sun could be rising or setting. It could be a locomotive or it could be a streetlight. Who the hell knows? And it's up to us, actually, to, to face that down. And if we don't face it down, we could face really bad things. And no history is going to save us. There, there is no cunning out there that's going to protect us from ourselves. And, um, uh, uh, I, and I'm with Sandy that there are 
you know, deep disfigurations in our structure which make things worse, which make the kind of frustrations which create the anger, which create the resentment, which creates the populist uh, Republican Party with, again, the alignment that we see now. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not with Sandy that a constitutional convention to, to, uh, can save us because I don't, you know, if you play poker, you don't put all your chips in. And uh, I think that's a move of desperation, not a move of, of, uh, of strategy. But um, I, I'm in agreement that, you know, it's contributing to it. And uh, I just take that as part of the problem to be open. Fantastic. So you guys have a lot to respond to. Um, uh, I'm going to put one other question on the table um, and then pretty soon invite you all um, if you have questions to involve you. Um, so I, and I think everyone up here has mentioned briefly that what started out as what seemed like a larger disagreement by the end of the book seemed to be more a, a smaller disagreement in the, in the scope of the views out there. Um, I think that's what Trump does, right? You 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 introduce an extreme position, um, and and everyone else who used to be on two sides of of the room are now suddenly all in the corner together. Um, but I think one area of potential disagreement that you guys might still have, um, and this is my question, uh, if you do, is um, what what is the fundamental purpose of our constitution? Um, it's a basic question, a grand question, as all basic <laughs> questions are. Uh, but it seems to me, and, and Jack, you allude to this a lot in the book, where you say, you know, the, the Constitution is basically, it's, its prime function is to keep peace. It's to, his law is to order a system in which we can politically disagree with each other without things leading to violence. Um, and Sandy, I, I take it from you that you expect more of the Constitution, that to you it's more of a uh, more of a preambular document. It is, it is the primary mechanism by which we are supposed to, um, uh, you know, by which our will and even our, our, our hopes and our futures are supposed to come to fruition. And so do you disagree about what is the fundamental purpose? And if so, because I think you do, I mean, is that one of the primary bases for your disagreement about whether or not to concentrate so intently on the document, as you put so many eggs in that basket, um, versus, well, no, it's, it's about kind of keeping the peace, and after that, we can do a lot of our constitutional manipulation outside of the document. I think one way of answering that question, to what extent, at the end of the day, do we recognize that Hobbes was right, that we live in a terrifying world if we don't have an effective government, life is going to be nasty, loose, and short. And provision of security really is the purpose of government. Everything else takes second place. One might hope that it would provide something more, but that is the purpose. As against, you're absolutely right. The one part of the Constitution that I unequivocally like, and that my wife and I focus on quite extensively in our book, um, and I, again, I want to emphasize that the book is written ostensibly for teenagers as part of the intervention in civic education, that the preamble really is inspiring. It does, it rejects Hobbes in favor, you know, you can pick some other favorite political theorists, but it says that we come together for something more than staving off a nasty, gruesome, short life through some sort of government. I mean, the other thing constitutions do is to provide reliable information on how you, assuming you have elections, how you get elected, how long your term is, and very roughly what your powers are. But um, you know, the rights provisions, I've come to agree substantially with James Madison that they're either parchment barriers or are not really central to understanding how the Constitution truly operates. Um, um, but you know, that would be my answers to the point of Constitutions. I just want to make one very brief comment with regard to what Justin said. And my 
some of my awkward comments. I am not so fearful that there are mushroom clouds in our future as I was, say, in 2017, because in all seriousness, I have come to the conclusion that Donald Trump is a real estate developer. He's a grifter. He's a real estate developer who, when he looks at North Korea, sees a beach that can be developed. Um, if John Bolton were president, a graduate of this law school, I would be terrified. I think Bolton is a warmonger. I don't think that Trump is a warmonger in the same way. I do fear that his combination of complete ignorance and distractionism could lead us toward a war with Iran. But I don't think he wants that. I think what he most wants is to make lots of money. And generally speaking, unless you really are a titan in the arms industry, and Donald Trump isn't, that's not the way to increase his fortune. So in terms of, you know, Bureau of Atomic Scientists and their clock, I'm probably, you know, 30 seconds less apocalyptic now. But it is because I have this view of Donald Trump as a third-world drifter um, who is not committed in a way that at one point I feared he might be more committed to um, <laughs> foreign interventions. And in fact, to be perfectly frank, although I, most of the time I wish that Hillary Clinton had been elected, um, I do think that we would probably have a more, shall we say, muscular foreign policy, a deliberately muscular foreign policy today than we do under Trump. And I cannot say that I would be encouraged by that. 